a second language, uh, you're going to need to use the Zoom. Um, and uh, we have extra headsets if you do not have. So Tania is just going to give you that message in Spanish and then we'll get started. Hola, muy buenas tardes. Muchas gracias por estar el día de hoy eh, con nosotros. Eh, vamos a tener diferentes historias que nos van a estar compartiendo los diferentes panelistas, pero también vamos a tener insumos de diferentes representantes de gobierno. Esta sesión va a estar, eh, o se va a dar en diferentes eh, idiomas, por lo que les invitamos a que si van a requerir traducción, español, inglés, francés, francés también, entonces que se conecten una eh, al Wi-Fi de, 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 de aquí, al menos que quieran utilizar sus datos, que también está bien, ahí está la clave del Wi-Fi. En segundo lugar, la eh, traducción va a ser a través de la plataforma de Zoom. Entonces, van a ver un código QR más pequeñito. Ahí es como van a poder conectarse al Zoom. En algunos casos les va a salir como un eh, anuncio, ¿no? Que, que, que vi que estaba confundiendo a varias personas. Solamente denle saltar intro y se les va a mover ya a la página de registro del Zoom y ya se van a poder registrar y seleccionar el canal en el idioma que ustedes deseen. Bueno, gracias. Y cualquier cosa, aquí estamos atrás por si necesitan apoyo. Okay. Um, also, we're going to have more people arriving. So if you can find space for yourself, that will be great. But we're kind of reaching the capacity of the room. Uh, without further ado, we're going to get started. Uh, so we're going to uh, invite the uh, director of the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program of UNESCO to provide the opening words and then hand over to our moderator. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Um, good afternoon. Uh, and also, um, Good evening uh, or good morning, depending on where you are connected for those who are online with us. Um, on behalf of UNESCO, I'm really delighted to officially welcome you to this uh, side event uh, within the UN 2020 Water Conference. As you know, this side event is um, on indigenous people and water, joint commitment to transforming water governance, climate adaptation and biodiversity. Um, we all have just say water is life. Yes, water is life, but for indigenous people, water is more than water is life. Water is also uh, cultural, um, spiritual, and also economic dimension. Unfortunately, the water crisis we face today disproportionately affects indigenous people who, on, who are on the front line of many challenges, such as climate change, pollutant contamination, and the challenges of access of clean and safe water. I want to stress the fact that also um, women and girls within the indigenous people are unfortunately those who are the most uh, affected because of their duty in being in charge of going to fish water. This, but despite those challenges, um, and this people shows a lot of resilience uh, in adapting to the situation and also in contributing to protect water and also to protect the environment. And these people were able through their knowledge, traditional knowledge, customary practices and innovative approaches, they were able to significantly contribute to the water governance, climate adaptation and biodiversity conservation. I know that you will share some concrete examples to uh, fill the discussion and to come out with some concrete way forward. Within the water domain, um, the issue of indigenous people and uh, water was not considered fully, but I'm pleased to inform you that within the process of preparation of this very, very important conference, uh, during Dushanbe, there was a special um, event organized to really take into account the importance of knowledge gathered and practices 
available within any knowledge and these people to bring it on board. So this is why, as you know, we, even within the final declaration of Dushanbe, a clear mention was made concerning the contribution of indigenous people vis-a-vis -vis water management. Um, we are using this dynamic within UNESCO now to, have to make the link with our program, as you know, the link program, local and indigenous knowledge program with our IHP program, the intergovernmental hydrological program, which is on science for a water secure in the changing environment. We want to moving forward to uh, bridge the two knowledges. So the knowledge in code of science and then the knowledge which is coming from local communities, from indigenous people, because we believe that there is an opportunity to leverage all that knowledge. Um, in that regard, I want really to thank uh, those who were behind in organizing this. First of all, from, from Mumbai State, the two co-hosts of the conference, the UN 2020 conference, Tajikistan and uh, Netherlands, and also uh, Australia, Bolivia, Canada, Chile, and Mexico, who provided official sponsoring for this work of, for this event. Of course, all other uh, countries from uh, later. I want also to thank, of course, we are here within the uh, conference room within UNDP. And we want to really appreciate and thank you for the, the support, not only for the technicality aspect, also for financial support in making this happen. And also other uh, UN entities, uh, UNFCCC, UN, UN, UNPFW, uh, FILAC, FAO, and all those institutions provide support in organizing this event. So I, before co I'm concluding, I want to stress the commitment of UNESCO in leveraging the experience, the know-how available within these people, because this is very, very important. Um, moving forward so that everybody could be part of the solution. And you heard many things during this conference. Everybody is part of the solution. We need to be inclusive, leaving no one behind. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the conclusion and the recommendation of the forum. Thank you. Now, now I would like to hand over to our uh, moderator, uh, Mirna. You have the floor to moderate the remaining of this event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, señora Abu Amani, y muchas gracias a UNESCO y a todos los organizadores de esta importante actividad. Quisiera iniciar el evento invitando a su excelencia Marta Delgado Peralta, Subsecretaria de Relaciones Internacionales de México. Muchísimas gracias. Muy buenas tardes tengan todas y todos desde México. A nombre del canciller Marcelo Ebrard, les deseo eh, pues que tengan una discusión muy productiva el día de hoy. Como ustedes saben, México es un país que tiene un reto, un desafío diferenciado. Nuestro territorio tiene eh, un desafío diferenciado en el manejo del agua. Tenemos una abundancia en el sur, tenemos una escasez y una sequía en el norte, pero al mismo tiempo también tenemos retos importantes para poder tener una, un manejo más, um, eh, un manejo integrado y más comunitario del agua. Eh, para nosotros es muy importante eh, la presencia en este evento hoy de legisladores del de Instituto Nacional eh, Indigenista de México, de nuestras autoridades locales, los gobiernos locales y, por supuesto, del gobierno federal. 
Eh, quisiera decir también que México ha tenido una política ambiental eh, importante que nos llevó a elevar el nivel de ambición sobre nuestras contribuciones de cambio climático recientemente en la COP 27 de Sharm el Sheikh en Egipto. Quisiera mencionar que en esta conferencia se dio enorme relevancia al respeto del derecho humano al agua, al respeto del derecho humano a un medio ambiente sano. Tenemos que proponer soluciones que integren también el gran conocimiento que tenemos de las comunidades indígenas en el manejo del agua y de las cuencas. Tenemos que considerar que eh, los desafíos más grandes están en las zonas periurbanas y en las zonas rurales del país y también que eh, tanto el agua como el saneamiento tenem, eh, son un desafío para el cumplimiento de otros derechos humanos eh, que están vinculados no solamente con los temas de medio ambiente sino en sí mismo con, con eh, los derechos humanos. La política de México tiene una profunda convicción en eh, transformar la gobernanza del agua y también hemos sido activos en la preparación del marco post 2020 de la conferencia de biodiversidad que fue en Montreal en diciembre. Todos estos ámbitos multilaterales parecen muy lejanos a veces de lo que la realidad de las personas y de las comunidades indígenas viven y nosotros como, bueno, eh, diplomáticos y en la política exterior, estamos eh, muy convencidas de que es indispensable tocar esta tierra hacia abajo con las comunidades y las organizaciones sociales para crear mecanismos innovadores. Eh, permítanme compartir con ustedes que en el año 2020 México hizo un eh, decreto histórico que estableció una comisión para las personas de la comunidad Yaqui en el norte de México, el norte donde yo nací, es el, el estado de Sonora, también la comunidad ya aquí está en el otro país, en Estados Unidos, entonces hemos hecho un esfuerzo por tener, eh, escuchar cuáles son sus necesidades y que la, y se estableció la primera prioridad de acción con uh, la, el distrito de irrigación de la comunidad ya aquí, que bueno, supongo que se platicará también más adelante por mis colegas mexicanos. Ese es un mecanismo innovador en donde tenemos que cumplir con los derechos que tiene la comunidad yaqui al agua para el uso agrícola y está siendo ejecutado por una comunidad, administración comunitaria de acuerdo con la especificidad cultural y las formas de organización específicas de esta comunidad. Eh, también quisiera decirles que estamos fortaleciendo las instituciones y la gobernanza de toda la gestión de cambio climático y también de las instituciones que tienen que ver con la facilitación y el acceso de las comunidades indígenas a todo, al agua, al internet, a la educación, a la salud, al desarrollo, al empleo. Y finalmente quisiera enfatizar la importancia de tener una Política de participación plural in, que, que incluya, con, pero realmente, ¿no? O sea, que incluya con la convicción de los gobiernos de que tenemos una gran sabiduría ancestral en las comunidades indígenas, que debemos también una, tenemos una deuda histórica con las comunidades indígenas en términos uh, de ofrecimiento de oportunidades. Y finalmente que tenemos que tener diálogos que sean productivos y modificaciones a nuestro marco de actuación burocrático, legal, administrativo, que incluyan una visión distinta que tienen las comunidades indígenas del manejo de sus territorios. Yo quisiera dejar mi intervención aquí, seguramente podremos tener preguntas, discutir y despedirme en una de las 68 lenguas indígenas de México la lengua náhuatl, ma cuale teotlac no es ni guan, ma cuale chumachil tigan al mochan, ni papakipampa o antiasi con mesta tlautia. Pinkipali, manuba pain, ay saram. Yo respondo en mi lengua, misquita, y le agradecemos por, por sus palabras y por 
plantear el desafío de transformar la gobernanza del agua, tomando en cuenta los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, los conocimientos de los pueblos indígenas y por compartirnos esa, esa experiencia que ustedes están promoviendo con el pueblo yaqui, que precisamente es un pueblo transfronterizo. Muchas gracias. A continuación le doy la palabra a Alberto Pizarro, secretario técnico del FILAC. Adelante, Alberto. Gracias, Mirna. Mario Mario Pupeñi Pulamien, Mario Mario Compuche, Inche Alberto Pizarro Chañilao Piñén. Eh, he empezado esta presentación justamente en el idioma de, del, cual, del pueblo del cual soy originario, soy mapuche, de Temuco, la región de la Araucanía, del sur de Chile, y he tenido el privilegio de empezar como secretario técnico de FILAC eh, durante el mes de marzo. Así que quería empezar justamente considerando a quienes me precedieron también hacerlo en mi idioma original. Eh, bueno, a nombre del Fondo de, para el Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas de América Latina y el Caribe, FILAC, eh, darle la más cordial y fraternal bienvenida a todos los representantes de los gobiernos de Australia, Bolivia, Canadá, Chile, México, así como a los representantes del PNUD, FAO, DESA, Convenio Marco del Cambio Climático, Oficina del Alto Comisionado para los Derechos Humanos, eh, FIDA, PMA, PNU, eh, MA, eh, OIT, OMS, también saludar al Instituto Internacional del Agua de Estocolmo y al Fondo Pahuanca, por cierto, eh, y a las organizaciones de pueblos indígenas y redes regionales que están presentes. Quiero iniciar eh, mi intervención también agradeciendo a Nigel Crojo de UNESCO eh, por la organización y por habernos invitado a ser co-sponsors eh, de este tan importante evento que se desarrolla en el marco de la Conferencia Mundial del Agua, donde los pueblos indígenas tenemos mucho que decir y contribuir a través de soluciones concretas para transformar la gobernanza del agua y garantizar su acceso. Mucho se ha dicho que el agua es uno de los elementos más importantes y a pesar de que el planeta se constituye en un 70% de esta, solo el 2,5% es agua dulce capaz de sostener la vida humana en el planeta. Durante estos últimos años, las problemáticas del agua, medio ambiente, biodiversidad y bosques están marcando la agenda multilateral. Desde Naciones Unidas se ha aprobado, como ustedes bien saben, mediante resolución 71-222, el segundo diseño internacional de agua para el desarrollo sostenible, 2018-2028, para coadyuvar en el avance y cumplimiento de las metas del ODS-6. El derecho al agua es una de las garantías indispensables para asegurar un nivel de vida adecuado, en particular porque es una de las condiciones fundamentales para la supervivencia. Sin agua no hay vida, como quienes dijeron que me, me predicieron. El agua no puede ser tratada como un producto, debe tratarse como un bien social y cultural, no como una mercancía más, como muchos quisieran. Es fundamental asegurar justamente el derecho al agua, su disponibilidad, su calidad, accesibilidad en un contexto de igualdad de acceso y no discriminación. Todo ello requiere de políticas públicas sólidas y eficientes para garantizar el acceso al derecho al agua, incluyendo marcos normativos claros y del máximo nivel jurídico. Objetivos claros con metas y plazos de ejecución concretas. La humanidad hoy enfrenta gran, grandes desafíos. A, la, a las crisis financiera, climática y recientemente sanitaria provocada por la COVID-19, se sumará otra, el riesgo inminente de una crisis mundial del agua. Así lo menciona el informe de Naciones Unidas, presentado a inicios de esta semana, resaltando los riesgos y consecuencias que podría enfrentar la humanidad en las próximas décadas si no tomamos acciones urgentes. Desde FILAC, Realizamos cuatro diálogos con representantes de organizaciones de pueblos indígenas, jóvenes indígenas, mujeres indígenas y entidades gubernamentales. El objetivo de estos diálogos fue generar un espacio de difusión y análisis sobre la situación de los pueblos indígenas con relación al agua en América Latina y el Caribe, que permita avanzar hacia la construcción de una agenda común de los pueblos sobre el derecho humano al agua 
para la vida, así como construir reflexiones e identificar experiencias positivas desde los pueblos indígenas en la gestión y gobernanza del agua, de los cuales se generaron importantes insumos que contribuirán a la construcción de la agenda de los pueblos indígenas y el derecho humano justamente al agua y saneamiento. En el marco de esta Conferencia Mundial sobre el Agua, que a su vez permitirá a los gobiernos transformar la gobernanza del agua y cumplir con sus compromisos de garantizar el derecho al agua y saneamiento, así como lograr los ODS de la Agenda 2030, en particular, como dije anteriormente, el ODS 6, teniendo en cuenta la perspectiva de los pueblos indígenas. En ese sentido, es para mí muy grato hacer entrega a cada uno de ustedes de la memoria de los diálogos que contiene, contiene las conclusiones y recomendaciones de los pueblos indígenas, que podrán posteriormente terminar esta reunión, podrán retirar, tenemos varios ejemplares, esperemos alcance para cada uno y cada uno de ustedes, eh, donde justamente a través de estas acciones los pueblos indígenas desean poner de relieve que sus culturas, conocimientos científicos y prácticas, muchas veces hay que decirlo despreciadas, son una fuente notable para dar respuesta a las grandes crisis que enfrentamos en el momento actual y pensando en el futuro de la humanidad. Así lo refleja el reciente informe del Relator Especial de Naciones Unidas sobre los Derechos Humanos al Agua Potable y el Saneamiento, Pedro Arrojo, el cual destaca que los pueblos indígenas han preservado gran parte de la biodiversidad y los ecosistemas acuáticos existentes, así como la calidad de las aguas en sus territorios ancestrales, para su propio beneficio y el de la sociedad en general. Toda vez que el concepto del agua que tienen los pueblos indígenas como bien común, que está a disposición de todos y todas, sin ser propiedad de nadie, supone un valioso ejemplo de gestión comunitaria del agua potable y el saneamiento. Para finalizar, les puedo decir que pueden contar con la Secretaría Técnica del FILAC para trabajar de manera conjunta con estados, organismos, agencias y pueblos indígenas para garantizar el derecho humano al agua y saneamiento para todos a través de compromisos conjuntos y un mecanismo de seguimiento eficiente. Muchas gracias, Charles Tumay. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Alberto Pizarro, por recordarnos el derecho al agua que es uno de los planteamientos centrales de los pueblos indígenas. Les recuerdo que este evento está siendo transmitido por Zoom y si tienen problemas, el código de acceso está en la pantalla para que puedan también tener acceso. A continuación, I would like to invite Simone Steele, Executive Secretary of UNFCCC, to to share your inputs. And just as a reminder, if you need to follow in a language of your choice, English, French, or Spanish, the code is up on the wall, so you can scan uh, both the internet connection and uh, the uh, Zoom connection. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chair, and <laughs> colleagues, friends. It is an absolute pleasure to be speaking at this event and to be amongst all of you. Leveraging the collective knowledge and experience we have in this room today is so important to the process. I think it was said in the, um, the opening statement as I came in, everyone is part of the solution. We here are all part of the solution. From the outset, I want to be clear. We need to rethink our approach to addressing the water climate nexus. And we have much to learn from those that hold indigenous knowledge. Indigenous peoples have been managing and governing water resources since time immemorial. From places with abundant water to semi-arid and arid environments. Water is not just a resource to be managed. It is the lifeblood of our planet. 
With respect and reverence to this fact, let us reframe our thinking and approach to water management. Last year was a productive year for bringing indigenous peoples into the conversation on water inside and outside of the UNFCCC process. COP27 provided a space to feature water prominently through many channels. Indigenous peoples and local communities have been helping shape intergovernmental negotiations and the broader narrative. This shone through in several COP27 decisions. COP27 re-emphasized the critical role of water for climate change adaptation and related co-benefits. Governments were urged to integrate the protection and restoration of water and water-related ecosystems into their adaptation efforts. The, device, the, the diverse knowledge systems of ind indigenous peoples were also referenced in the IPCC reports. The IPCC has emphasized the critical role indigenous knowledge systems and knowledge and local knowledge plays in land management. Governments, Governments have, met, have met to consult on the Glasgow Shamrock Shake Work Program on the global goal on adaptation in the Maldives. Participants focused on the changes in mindsets and worldviews needed for a transformation in adaptation, incorporating Indigenous people's wisdom, values, and knowledge. In response to the global momentum on water, the UN Climate Change Secretariat has meanwhile established an action pledge through its Nairobi program on adaptation to address water climate nexus challenges. The pledge hinges on three major pillars, knowledge, innovation, and action. The pledge is aimed at catalyzing and strengthening communities of practice to address knowledge gaps. Secondly, to unlock innovation. And thirdly, the scaling up of action to address the nexus of water climate challenges in developing countries. Knowledge holders have an opportunity to contribute to this action pledge through the UNFCCC's local communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform. The platform is designed to strengthen knowledge, help exchange experiences, and increase the particip particip participation of local communities and Indigenous Peoples in the UNFCCC process. I fully support efforts to ensure the voices, solutions, and values of Indigenous Peoples and local communities are incorporated into our process, as well as our overall work to drive climate ambition and build resilient societies. Governments now need to increase engagement and collaboration with Indigenous peoples and local communities in designing and implementing climate policies and actions. This includes developing and delivering on nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans. Only 40 countries globally have NAPs. I have committed the UNFCCC to coming up with a plan to get all least developed countries by COP28 on the journey to delivering on their national adaptation plans. I'm inspired by those of you here in this room, and I will take back a request to my team to see how Indigenous knowledge can be properly reflected, better reflected, as part of this planning process and the plans themselves. I look forward to our discussion. I thank you. I think I thank Simon Steele for his inputs and 
I am the commitment of indigenous peoples is to participate in plan at all levels. So we take the challenge and we commit. If you open the space for us at the global level and at the national levels, we will be there and we will participate. So thank you very much. A continuación, invito a Darío Mejía, al presidente del Foro Permanente, para hacer uso de la palabra. Adelante. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias a, eh, a todos, a todas, por esta invitación. Saludo de manera muy especial a los organizadores, a la hermana Mirna también por su moderación. Eh, para mí es un honor compartir esta tarde estas palabras con eh, delegaciones de los Estados miembros, con las entidades de las Naciones Unidas, amigos y amigas. Durante la presente semana en la que hemos estado aquí en, en Nueva York, yo creo que hay unos mensajes que han quedado relativamente claros eh, para todos eh, quienes estamos acá. El primer mensaje que yo creo que está en nuestra mente es que es indiscutible que como humanidad estamos enfrentando una crisis de agua que no necesariamente es una crisis de escasez de agua. Eh, pero tenemos crisis de agua. Solo el 3% del agua del planeta es agua fresca. Y de esa, solo el 1.2% puede ser usada para el consumo. Somos 8 billones de personas, 8 mil billones de personas, y de esas, una de cada tres personas no tiene acceso a agua en condiciones dignas. El segundo mensaje que yo creo que está en nuestra retícula, en nuestra mente, y que ojalá se quede instalada por siempre, es el positivo rol de los pueblos indígenas en eh, abordar las crisis actuales. Y que el agua es, yo digo, el hilo conductor que permite el entendimiento de las distintas crisis. Eh, de la crisis climática, de la crisis ambiental, de las crisis alimentarias. ¿sí? Y que el agua es el centro de estas crisis porque se trata no solo de un derecho, sino de un ciclo vital. Que el agua no es solo un derecho. El agua es un ciclo vital. Y en esa medida, el rol de los pueblos indígenas en distintas partes del mundo, no solo como cuidadores, sino de ayudantes en la producción del agua, se está cumpliendo. Se está cumpliendo. A pesar de los enormes retos que enfrentan los pueblos indígenas. Ahora bien, observo otra cosa que me parece relevante destacar. Y es que, a pesar de las dificultades, los pueblos indígenas están logrando posicionar su punto de vista en la arena internacional, lo cual es muy importante. Sin embargo, hay una preocupación detrás de este aparente posicionamiento. Y es que si bien... Eh, la matriz discursiva sobre las contribuciones son importantes. Si no adopta un camino de coherencia eh, sobre la necesidad de respetar los derechos territoriales y los derechos a la libre determinación de los pueblos indígenas, el lenguaje de la contribución puede terminar en una máscara que oculta mayores expropiaciones. De manera que, queridas hermanas y queridos amigos y hermanos, ninguna contribución es sostenible 
si no se aseguran y no se respetan los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Y esto es fundamental para las distintas, eh, los distintos actores involucrados en la política internacional. Para los estados, porque los estados deben retomar el camino del reconocimiento de los pueblos indígenas en aquellos países donde aún no lo reconocen, a pesar que dentro de sus fronteras los pueblos indígenas se autoidentifican y están haciendo su trabajo de contribución. Y en aquellos estados donde ya se ha reconocido a los pueblos indígenas, es fundamental que se adopten metas concretas, amarradas a las grandes discusiones globales, como por ejemplo, cambio climático y conservación de la diversidad. Y esto es fundamental porque de otro modo no estaremos caminando por un real camino de sostenibilidad, sino de una nueva forma de expropiación. Y lo digo porque paradójicamente donde los pueblos indígenas son los que están contribuyendo con la conservación de la diversidad, con el cuidado del agua, son los que están siendo perseguidos, criminalizados, y muchas veces hablamos de la criminalización a los cuidadores de agua, pero ¿qué son los cuidadores del agua? No son otra cosa que personas, compañeros, hermanos nuestros, que están ejerciendo su derecho a la libre determinación, comuneras y comuneros. Como, por ejemplo, sucedió recientemente con el hermano Mendúa en Ecuador, o como sucede casi que a diario, infortunadamente, con muchos guardias y autoridades indígenas en mi propio país. Sigue habiendo criminalización. De manera que yo creo que esta es una enorme oportunidad en la que estamos ahora conversando. Ya en el pasado, los pueblos indígenas lograron que sus conocimientos sean reconocidos no como conocimiento científico ni validado por el conocimiento científico, sino como conocimiento efectivo en el cuidado de la vida en el planeta. Así, por ejemplo, en la Cumbre de Seguridad Alimentaria fue reconocido en el WIPALA Paper y el panel de expertos eh, intergubernamental sobre cambio climático también ha dicho que no solo entienden la crisis actual, sino que aportan soluciones y pueden contribuir en la gobernanza global frente a las crisis. Por eso, el punto de partida en esta conferencia no puede ser menor a, estas, a estos avances. Cualquier decisión que tomen los estados y las agencias de las Naciones Unidas para dar seguimiento y continuidad en la década del agua debe contar con los pueblos indígenas como actores en la mesa y decidiendo el menú. Esto es muy importante. Con esto les doy las gracias por haberme invitado y eh, felicidades y éxitos en todas estas discusiones muy amables. Agradecemos al hermano Agradecemos al hermano Darío por su. Agradecemos al hermano Darío por su, su aporte y por recordarnos que el problema no es escasez de agua, sino la necesidad de transformar la gestión del agua, asegurando los derechos y la participación de los pueblos indígenas. A continuación vamos a tener una serie de estudios de caso en donde vamos a poder reafirmar y confirmar esa, esa capacidad de gestión de los pueblos indígenas. Les recuerdo el tiempo a los que van a hacer uso de la palabra. Our first case study is from Australia of water related activities. And it will be uh, presented by, by Bradley Mogridge from the Indigenous Water Science University of Canberra, Australia. Bradley? Um, 
also what we're going to do, uh, Brad, you can take over here, but we're going to change some of the speakers. So we're going to invite the team from Canada, Australia, uh, from uh, Chad uh, to come and join us at the front. Um, so we'll just swap speakers up here. Uh, pour tout le monde euh, qui voudrait suivre en français, évidemment, on a noté qu'on a un problème avec euh, l'interprétation virtuelle. On, on vous demande euh, nos excuses. C'est la première fois qu'on a essayé de faire ça. C'était un peu compliqué. On va continuer maintenant en anglais et après, on va faire un petit résumé pour vous aider. Euh, donc, et pour les interventions diplomatiques, euh, on aura les cas d'études. Après, il va y avoir les interventions diplomatiques aussi. Donc, on, on, on vous invite euh, à, à assister. Brad, uh, the floor is yours. Who's driving the slides? Uh, yeah. I'll just say next slide. Yeah. Okay, the slides, you're okay with the slides? Yeah, I'm everyone. Uh, it's an absolute honor, honor to be here uh, all the way from Australia. It took 42 hours to fly here. That was a long haul. Um, I better get on with it. I've only got six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> five, five now yeah uh acknowledge country um acknowledge all the dignitaries and beautiful faces i see in the room thank you for all coming uh i'm a camilleroy man which is northwest new south wales you can sort of see a chunk there on of australia that's my country and some of my old people and obviously the next generation there of why i do what i do so it's always um they come with me wherever i go next slide please uh, so water is protected by our law, uh, our, our traditional law. It's it's in our songs, our dances, our dreaming stories, and of course our art. On the driest inhabited continent on earth, water is crucial. So I'm trying to build how we can put traditional knowledge and science together and build it back into the way we manage our landscape. So acknowledging our diversity is, is crucial. We're all different. We're not all the same uh, Indigenous people. We don't have all the same values. I'll try a map in a sec. But how our old people knew water, getting to relearn that. We need to get back on country and relearn how our old people knew water. Tell our stories our way, because we're tired of other people telling our stories. Indigenous research methodologies is why I'm, why I'm here and what I'm doing is because it's, I'm trying to build a research methodology for myself. Uh, it's a bit selfish, but it's for, for me, for my people, with my people. Um, and rights and values of water. How can we decolonize water? We're, we're highly affected by colonization in Australia around our connection and right and access to water. And then obviously we move towards that system of, of validating our knowledge, but we need to validate our knowledge, not Western science. Next slide, please. Just some happy photos of my country. So if we're looking after country, these species, these cultural species are happy. So the, the wedge-tailed eagle is one of our apex predators and it's a beautiful bird, it's a big bird. Um, and if I go into witness protection, my name will be Aquila Audax. That sounds, that's a cool Latin name. Um, and bra the brolga. The brolgas are important birds for us. We watch them, we dance them. And when they're turning up to our wetlands and our water places, because water is in the landscape at the right time, we're happy. And I suppose, you know, some of the brogas travel from Siberia. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a digitized map of Australia's water bodies. And you sort of see, there's a lot of water bodies there, but as soon as you move away from coastal regions, you're in desert country. And to know, to know that country and to know that water is how you survive. And I suppose Aboriginal people have that knowledge and Torres Strait Island people, but we don't celebrate that. It's seen as a threat, maybe, I don't know. Maybe we're too smart. Um, next slide, please. This shows the diversity of Australia. These are all the lang different languages on the Australian continent, pre-colonisation. Pre so we're not all the same. So my chunk there is on the eastern seaboard, the pale yellow. You move into the desert region, no idea what people are saying language-wise, linguistically. So we're very different in the way um, we, the language, the law, the diversity, the governance, and our responsibilities to country. So we're all different. So I suppose that's a that's a challenge. Next slide, please. So this is water policy 101 in Australia. So when it was colonized, our land and water was given away. Our rivers were modified, over extracted, polluted. Our people were not counted as human until the late 1960s. Think of that. 
1967, when we all counted as humans. I was just born not long after that. So I was born a human. So I was lucky. But my mum and my grandparents, not so lucky. And a couple of my brother here, Phil, he, was, he, he wasn't born a human. He wasn't counted as a human in Australia. So when we became human, all the good land and water was gone. So that's sort of the challenge we're on to. And in Australia, we've actually separated land and water as a co two commodities. And if we want water, we've got to go to the market and buy it. So water was ours, was taken off us, and now we've got to buy it. So that's, that's the, the state we're in. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a photo of cl a, climbing, a, a changing climate. This is my country, my mine of Phil's country. The Guaida wetlands, in, it's a Ramsar listed area. Uh, on the left, you can see it happy, full of water. October 2020, and then in December 2020 that year, that water hole was dry as a bone. And that's my son walking across. You can sort of see how depressed and his shoulders are slumped. So I suppose he's sad, but you know, that, that's, that's how our climate is changing. Next one. Storytelling. So this is what I'm trying to do. Storytelling is central to our epistemologies. I've only just learned that word, it's cool. Um, it's our science communication. Uh, stories go in circles. They're not a straight line. Everything around indigenous world is circles, yarning circles. We sit in circles and talk around fires. Corroborates are where our ceremonies happen. And of course, you see a lot of circular designs in indigenous art. But our storytelling is perceived as myth and legend. So into the realm of fiction, it's not real. So I suppose instead of seeing our knowledge as thousands of generations of observation and testing our country and knowing our country, we're seen as mumbo jumbo and folklore. Um, so I suppose that's that's what I'm trying to build in because I've had the privilege to be get a good education and and do do this thing called science, even though my old people were doing science way before. Last one, one more to go. Next slide, sorry. So shift the research paradigm away from my people as the researched. That's what we're being. We're some of the most researched people on the planet. Um, still learning how I relate to country and people. It's, 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 it's never ending. And I suppose we need to me rematriate water. I've just only found this word recently. It's a beautiful word. Get our women involved. And like my country, groundwater is women's business. And I'm a hydrogeologist. So I've got to be careful. I don't say the wrong thing because I'll get a clip up the ears from the Arnie's. Um, our knowledge and methods are evolving with climate change, but we're not in working group one yet for, for, for the IPCC documents. We're in working group two. So we've got to work our way into working group one, which is the science. I was a contributor to working group two, but you know, we're not seen as scientists yet. Um, fill the void of water management, Camilleroy science, as I said, by Camilleroy, with Camilleroy, for Camilleroy. That's why I'm in the game. Last one, that's it. Next slide. There we go. There's all my contacts if you want to have a yarn. And you can see my beard grow through COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley. What everything you were saying was like music in my ears. That decolonizing research is so important for indigenous peoples. So thank you for that excellent work. I will now invite my sister Hindu. Where are you, Hindu? Umaru Ibrahim, who will be sharing the case. No, child. Okay, Hindu and then. Thank you very much, uh, Mirna. Gamnyali. Good afternoon. Bon, bon apremidi and uh, buenas tardes. So I'm so glad to be with you here today uh, because uh, not only we have uh, several ministers who are here to listen, but I have also my minister who is with me here. So 
I think this is the importance of us using the international platform and having also our government to be with us and to see we are with the indigenous peoples of the world. What we are doing back home is reflecting at the international level and what we do at the international level must reflect also at the national and local level. So I have some case, case study, but as a global leaders of indigenous peoples, I have to share some realities of our own general indigenous issues first. So over the last decade, I can say, or last five years, there is a big recognition of the indigenous peoples at the international level. So starting by the Paris COP and coming to the last year in Canada, just to the end of the year COP15. So where we recognize indigenous people roles on environments, but yet when it's come to water, people are often forget the best tools, the best factory is the nature. So our forest purifies the water that can go to all the cities. Our soil filter the water that where we are getting the fresh water. So indigenous people are leading the best technology ever. You hear from my brother from Australia, what they are doing and the women are the best CEO, the chief ecological officer of those factory who are giving us the clean water we are drinking, but also who help us to produce the food. So indigenous people's life is way pollution free. So that needs to be understood by the UN agencies, by the government, and recognized by even indigenous peoples because we are the one who are best technology ever. So this way of life should be an inspiration because water is the blood of the mother earth. And today, there are a lot of vampires that consider that is normal to make the earth's blood as their food. So those vampires are, of course, the industrialized agriculture, the urbanization, the water waste, and the extractive industry. So we need to fight them. They take our land, they take our water, and they destroy the nature, the rhythm of the nature. In the Amazon, my brothers can tell you here, all the pollution in our rivers, who are bringing chemical just because they wanted to extract the gold. You can see how they can thinking about the water here. They think just to how they can construct a big dam to do a renewable energy. We need to get out from the first solutions. Water is not a commodity that we can sell. Water is for the life of everyone in each. We cannot use it just to buy certain kind of the communities. So that take me to a concrete examples of my own country, Chad. So Chad have the bigger lake who is number five bigger lake around Africa, the fresh water, who used to be 25,000 kilometers square of fresh water when my mother get born. And this lake just vanished to 90%. And I'm not old, I think. So then just in my age now in the lake is about 2000 kilometers square or less depending from the rainy season. All what we did as human being, extracting, mining, climate change and our lack vanishing in our eyes. So what we do as indigenous peoples to save this lake, I have two short examples to you share with you. So firstly, we can contribute to improve the knowledge, science about the water where the indigenous people's knowledge can be very helpful. And I'm so grateful that Simon is here from the climate secretary and Chad is among the 40 countries who present their NAPS document. And in this NAPS document, there is a specific paragraph where they talk about indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples knowledge. So that need not to be only 40 countries. It's have to be all the countries to present their NAPS document and include indigenous peoples as Chad did. Of course, everything is not ping in Chad, but we must recognize something and ask the government to do more. So as indigenous peoples, we have firstly that 80% of our 
access to the resources is going from this region. 90% of the lake disappearing. So what we did, we conduct a study seven years now with UNESCO to focus on traditional knowledge, science, to do the weather first cast. And I used to say that for those who know me, maybe Western knowledge have their telephone to have the application to see if it's going to rain or going to be drought. But we have our grandmothers who are our best application. And that study helped us to draw all the calendar, the seasonal calendars. And we, we realize those who are living between the Sahara and the Sahel, we have five seasons. Those who are living between the, Sahara, the Sahel and the tropical forest, we have seven seasons. And all those seasons are ecosystemic best and they are helping the cycle of the rain and the rain can help the cycle of the wind, of the star, of the birds, of the plant, and that help us to set up our way of living in harmony with the nature. But we have to protect those knowledge because we are doing the safeguard on it. The second example is how we can use the science, technology, and traditional knowledge. So this is the place where we use the 3D or 2D participatory mapping to bring the community together as expert because we used to just to go to the community and then say, we are the expert, we come to help you. We never listen from indigenous communities. They are the most expert one. So through the participatory mapping that we did, so the last one was around Lake Chad, 3,500 kilometers square, more than 256 villages, islands, and community stop who are the nomadic. We map a different kind of the water that I cannot translate it into French English because it only exists in our mother tongue. It's not all the piece of water is water. All piece of water have his quality, his quantity, and his way of living, surviving at Tessera. So that help us to mitigate the conflict between the communities fighting to access to the water. It help us to plan and manage better share the natural resources. So these examples of the case study we do it, it can be replicable around all the world and indigenous peoples must be the one who can guide those kinds of study. Finally, because I'm seeing my sister Mirna is looking me. So finally, for all of the peoples, indigenous peoples way of life, they are thinking we are old but we have the modern way of life because we are the future. Our technology can help to build the future of everyone. So protection of the nature, biodiversity, water have to be in one thing. Participation of the indigenous peoples must be in, the, in this conference and beyond. We have four decades, decade of water, decade of ecosystem restoration, decade of language, decade of ocean. What the hell is all the decade, decade, decade? Let us have all of them together in collaboration and let us have a mechanism where indigenous peoples can participate across all those decades. We cannot accept to act in silo around those decades. We have the study, we have the knowledge, so give us the space. We can show you what we are capable to do. Thank you. Thank you, Hindu. And each one of these cases can take us the whole day. So I really apologize that I'm pushing so we can end at 2.45. We now have the case study from Canada on indigenous-led conservation for the health of water ecosystems in Canada and the world, the Seal River Watershed Alliance by Stephanie Torasi. Stephanie? Please take the floor. What's here? Stephanie Thrasi, who's here? Then it's Oshina Hessling. It's um, nice to be here with you all. I'm speaking to you in my language, which is uh, Dennis Oshina. I am from Northern Manitoba in Canada. Um, it is right near the border of Nunavut. We are from a subarctic territory uh, where we are home to five species at risk. 
Uh, we are the largest protected area submission in Canada to date. And I'm hearing lots during this time here in New York about the issues that are happening uh, around the world with regards to water. I'm hearing lots about the pollution and the damage that we've all created uh, collectively. And I wanna share a little bit about a place that's really important to not only myself, but to everybody here in this room. This place that I call home, it is uh, 50,000 square kilometers. It is 99.97% pristine. So the intact, area the full watershed is the same as when my great 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 grandparents used to be nomadic and followed the caribou herds through uh, the area to harvest so this area of land that we are, have been that has been home to us um, is so vital to uh, not only ourselves and our cultures our languages and space but also to uh, the rest of the world we, um, we know that there are not a lot of spaces in the world that exist like this anymore. And for those reasons, it's really important for us to, to do our best to protect these spaces for our future generations. And, and the ways that we've been doing this is really quite simple in that we've been following the, the words and guidance of our elders. There was a time when, um, when we could speak with the, uh, the animals and with the people and during this time, the caribou, they used, they would migrate and they would travel, right? And there were some people uh, a long time ago who thought that they were getting smart and they started taking pieces of caribou hide, pieces of leather, and they would tie this piece of ribbon around the caribou's ear and the caribou left. And they didn't realize that um, when they did this, there was like a frenzy and everybody started doing the same thing because they're getting worried. They needed to say that this was my caribou. Okay, well, this one is mine and I'm going to keep this one, right? And, and the spirit of the caribou was so offended and so hurt by what their brothers and sisters were doing to them that they said that we're not going to come back for a long time because of this mentality that you have, that you can own us. And so it took a very long time for the caribou to come back to the people, come back to this world that we all live and share today. And so I think that this idea of ownership and this idea of management over lands and waters as we're here today is something that's really guided us and helped us in, in preserving this space and this land, this guiding principle of not being better than the land that we're on and not being better than the water that we're on which is really something that is um, so important in the work that we're doing. The other thing that I really wanted to say is that, you know, it's really hard for me to stand here and separate these things into different areas. Like I'm hearing some of our brothers and sisters say, in that I can't speak to you about water without speaking to you about the people, without speaking to you about the culture and the land and, and the languages that have brought us here. And so, um, you know, I really think that we need to remind you all that, that it, we can't do this work separately. We can't have little pockets of knowledge for one thing and not for the other and realize that there is no way to connect all of these things together so that we can really collectively do the best job that we can. Um, I know that I'm running out of time and I feel like I could talk for hours and hours about this place that I care so deeply about. But, you know, as I was coming here, um, there was two things that were shared with me. One of them was that it doesn't matter what you do in your life. If you don't have a connection to the land and the water where you come from, you will forever be poor. So as a person inside, in your spirit, you will always have that longing and that feeling that you need to fill your cup and you will never be able to fill it. And the other thing that I wanted to share with you is that um, we were always taught that you must always always, always respect the water uh, because it can, it gives, right? It gives, but it can also take and it also can uh, take whenever it wants. And for that reason, uh, it does not need our permission. The water does not need our permission to be here to, for us to have this big, 
profound discussions about it. It's still there and it's still existing and it's uh, going to do its best to, to be better, but it does need our help and it does need to be connected with all of the other work that we're doing. And I'm so um, happy and proud to be able to, to share some of the, the wisdom from my nation uh, in Northern Canada with you all today. Uh, it hasn't happened very long that our communities uh, were looked to as experts in these fields. And I'm really glad to see that slowly this narrative is changing. And I really look forward to the future when uh, the knowledge that we carry from our communities can be held in a higher regard than the Western science that has led us to where we are in the state of the world today. Because it's that way, the indigenous knowledge is literally older than the science that is being taught in the universities and it should be regarded as such and we should be giving that honor and that recognition to that knowledge that we're bringing to the table and this is something that is slowly starting to happen and i really look forward to a time when i can bring our elders and we can hear the things that they're saying, and we will not just think of it as something like folklore or just small traditions and things. They will actually be thought of as experts because that's what they are. So, Masi Cho Adita, with the biggest and the most thanks I could give in my language, uh, thank you for allowing me to share with you all today. Masi Cho. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing and reminding us that water is connected to that place that makes us feel so much that we miss when we're not there. So I, a continuación, invito a Saúl Vicente Vázquez para compartir estudios de caso en América Latina. Y el que. Tiene mi presentación. Padiusi Vicheka, Bizanaka, Toka Padiusi, Iraka, which is one ela and Rari, Yuski Sepela, which is the Bizanaka. Muy buenas tardes, hermanas, hermanos. Saludo a todas y todos ustedes. Y saludo a las altas autoridades que están con nosotros. Muchísimas gracias. Bueno, ¿quién es la persona? Y lo puedo compartir desde mi computadora también. ¿Lo comparto? Bueno, empezamos. Eh, quería empezar con una, con un poema en el género de haiku, que eh, ganó un niño de 12 años del estado de Tabasco en México. Y, des, y dice, amo la lluvia, cuando ves a la tierra, siembra su aroma. Eso es el premio. Que eh, ganó un niño de 12 años en el género de haiku, que es japonés. Y hemos dicho que el agua conecta los ecosistemas terrestres, de agua dulce, de aguas marinas, a través de ese ciclo hidrológico. Eh, nos han dicho también que las sociedades dependen de esos ecosistemas y los servicios que brindan para el agua potable, para los alimentos, para los medios de vida, para la mitigación y adaptación climática, para la salud, etc. Por lo tanto, el agua está indisolublemente ligada a tres pilares de desarrollo sostenible y proporciona valores sociales, culturales, ambientales, económicos y políticos. Estos vínculos entonces son transversales y sustentan el logro de casi todos los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Sin embargo, no podemos pasar por alto lo que ocurre, en este caso, en el continente de América Latina y el Caribe, por una serie de, de cuestiones y que quiero hacer referencia a algunos de estos casos que están documentados en una base de datos del Programa Universitario Intercultural de la Universidad Nacional de México. Ahí sostiene en esas bases documental que dice que de las tierras degradadas a nivel mundial, el 14% se encuentran en América Latina. De estas, 
las más impactadas por deforestación para cultivos comerciales y sobre pastoreo se encuentran en el norte de Brasil, en el Gran Chaco, entre Argentina, Bolivia y Paraguay, y en el área central de Chile. Otro ejemplo, la presa hidroeléctrica Belo Monte de Brasil, articulada con el proyecto minero Volta Grande y la minera Belo Sun, ha implicado que la deforestación se incrementara en 700% entre el año 2018 y 2019. Otro ejemplo nos señala que la JBC y el EDC, conocido como Bunge, de Brasil, entregan carne y soja a Carrefour, en Francia, de zonas ilegalmente deforestadas por ganaderización y agricultura intensiva. Otro ejemplo nos señala que en los nueve países que integran la cuenca del río Amazonas, las áreas dedicadas a la actividad agropecuaria se triplicaron desde 1985. Nos dice que entonces el sector, este sector es responsable del 84% de la deforestación amazónica. Quiero hacer referencia a México. Ahí el gobierno neoliberal entregó de las 179 áreas naturales protegidas, en el 37% hay concesiones mineras y alrededor del 50% de los territorios indígenas de ese país tienen concesiones mineras. Y luego nos han dicho que esto no es todo. La situación es más aterradora cuando leemos el llamado de atención de la Organización Mundial Meteorológica que nos informa que los glaciares tropicales de los Andes han perdido en promedio un 30% para el año 2020 y el riesgo que esto conlleva en escasez de agua para toda la población, para la agricultura, para los ecosistemas en general. Y por otro lado nos dicen que enfrentamos una crisis de escasez de alimentos. Y esta base documental dice que eso no es cierto, que no hay escasez de alimentos. Lo que pasa es que cerca del 60% de la producción europea de trigo se destina a la alimentación animal, mientras que el 40% del maíz cultivado en Estados Unidos de América se convierte en combustible para automóviles. También nos señala que a nivel global, el 80% de la cosecha mundial de soja se transforma en comida para animales, mientras que 23% del aceite de palma mundial se convierte en diésel, mientras que el agronegocio se expande en poder, control de tierras y comercio de semillas y granos. Otro tema es que el capitalismo verde ahora impulsa el tema de la minería. La determinación, por ejemplo, de la Unión Europea sobre el fin de los motores a combustión por el año 2035 requiere un aumento de disponibilidad mundial de litio, cobalto, níquel, cobre y grafito. Pero sin embargo, para producir una tonelada de litio en los salares de Atacama, en la región de Argentina, se evaporan 2.000 toneladas de agua. Situación muy difícil. Sin embargo, y a pesar de todo esto, otros estudios que el FILAC trabajó dan cuenta del papel fundamental de lo que los pueblos indígenas han jugado en la defensa y conservación de sus territorios, tal como se documenta en el informe del relator especial, pero yo hago énfasis en cuál. Uno de ellos, el sistema ancestral de los waru, waru camellones o sucacuyos de la región andina de Bolivia, Ecuador, Perú. La infraestructura agrícola desarrollada para el manejo del suelo y el agua para la agricultura de humedales y áreas con inundaciones temporales. Otro de estos estudios, señalamos, está en el desierto de Atacama, donde las comunidades aismaras no conciben a las aguas desvinculadas de las tierras que se riegan con ellas. Para ellos, ambos elementos conforman una unidad territorial indivisible. El hábitat del Ailu o la comunidad indígena, donde se recrea su cultura e identidad. Y otro ejemplo de estos estudios de caso es la comunidad cordillera blanca ubicada en Huaraz, Perú, que ha sanado el agua de sus ríos gracias a la complementación entre saberes ancestrales y soluciones científicas. Esto es, el río negro ha sido afectado por los relaves de, de la industria minera, poniendo en peligro la salud y la agricultura de estas comunidades. Frente a esto, la comunidad ha creado un sistema de bioremediación para capturar los metales de agua y la construcción de celdas de sedimentación utilizando ¿qué? plantas nativas como la totora, cuyas raíces son capaces de absorber los metales del agua. Estos son algunos ejemplos. ¿Qué es lo que han salido en las recomendaciones de los diálogos del FILAC? Muchas recomendaciones, pero quiero centrarme en una. Una de ellas es que esta, la Asamblea General de Naciones Unidas apruebe la creación de un mecanismo internacional de seguimiento y control de cumplimiento de los acuerdos internacionales en relación con la gestión de los recursos hídricos y que tenga un panel de expertos 
de conocimientos occidentales y los conocimientos indígenas y con la plena participación de los pueblos y comunidades indígenas. Esto es lo que se ha estado diciendo durante estos días, esto es lo que hemos escuchado aquí y si esto no se hace, de veras vamos a la catástrofe. No tenemos tiempo. La próxima Asamblea General debería de aprobar una iniciativa de esta naturaleza. Dios quise para la tubicha nevisana. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias al hermano Saúl por recordarnos la situación dramática, pero también recordarnos las soluciones. We now move to a very important segment of this event. Usually we talk a lot among ourselves as indigenous speakers. Today we want to listen also to some of the of the representatives of governments that are attending this session. So I will now invite Matt Datswell, head of water division from Australia to share with us. Thank you, uh, good, good afternoon. So um, I just um, begin by just uh, recognizing the indigenous Australians in this room, so Bradley and, and others, there's quite a few here, so I uh, recognize you. Um, uh, so yes, I'll give a, a national Australian government uh, perspective and, and I think you know, Bradley highlighted the challenges uh, that the, or the, the very poor situation that we find ourselves in now where uh, First Nations people, 65,000 years of, of uh, um, responsible water management, sustainable water management, Uh, connection with country uh, 200 odd years ago that ended uh, and uh, with colonization um, so uh, what where do we find ourselves now we, in, in very much a, 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 a period where uh, to date uh, a, a context of a country where western science and western laws uh, now dominate in particularly in terms of the uh, the water sector uh, um, amongst other things so um, couple of areas that we're, we're looking to, um, in, what we're, we're really trying to focus on is improving uh, First Nations roles in decision-making, uh, in, in, in how water is managed and uh, 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 in, in Australia. Uh, so some of the key areas that we're, we're, we're looking at, firstly, there is, uh, and Bradley raised this issue that uh, all water uh, under colonization vested in the state governments, in our, our, our provincial governments. Uh, and in some cases, they've all, all that water was fully allocated out to interests. Uh, and, and so we now face the situation where uh, to recover that water, and particularly uh, where we would like to recover that water and return it, uh, some of that water to First Nations, uh, Indigenous people, it has to be bought. Uh, that's, uh, that's the way our laws operate and, and do operate in some areas. In some other areas where water has not yet been fully allocated, uh, there are still water allocation decisions and balances need to be made up in terms of the different interests uh, in Australia being represented. So, uh, and that's still operating within Western laws, of course. So that's, that's a challenging area and, and there are a few areas that can still occur. So trying to increase First Nations ownership of water or having that ability to um, uh, put water where they need it to, to um, support cultural, economic and social outcomes is, is, is an important area, but it's, it's a challenging and, and it's going to become quite an expensive area for, this, for, the, for the, um, the Australian government. Um, the other real key area that we're looking at is uh, um, First Nations uh, contributions to decision making. Um, so really the, the key there is uh, we have uh, a National Water Act Um, that uh, that uh, talks about uh, the involvement of, of uh, Indigenous people in uh, or goes to the matters of water resource management. Uh, and we have an opportunity to review that in the next uh, one or two years. And uh, it'll be one of the key very areas of focus for that Water Act is uh, how can we improve the role of uh, Indigenous people in water management and water resource management decision making. Um, so that's, that's, that's one area. Uh, we also have a national water policy uh, framework, a roadmap that, that guides our, um, our uh, and guides the work of both the national government and our provincial governments in how they manage water resources. Uh, and again, we are reviewing that uh, that uh, in agreement that was struck about 20 years ago. And again, one of the very key areas of focus, uh, climate change is one, the other is indigenous people interests. Uh, and, uh, um, and again, embedding and trying to embed Uh, more strongly through both uh, national and provincial laws, um, the, the role and recognition of Indigenous people and the ability for them to contribute their traditional knowledge and, uh, and um, values into the decision making. Um, so uh, we're going trying to get to the very heart of the issue, the very key uh, levers that, that are available um, in Australia for water resource management. 
The other areas that we've, we've been working on is um, uh, ensuring that we have good advice coming to government uh, by uh, Indigenous people. So uh, establishing a committee on Aboriginal water interests um, that will be advising and having key input into those, uh, uh, the, the review of our Water Act and review of our national water uh, um, uh, policy. Uh, there are other, um, there, there are a number of other things we're doing, but I won't go into those in detail. I will mention also that that Australia has uh, um, uh, committed to and announced uh, a uh, First Nations Water Ambassador. Uh, so this will be a uh, an ambassador that is appointed uh, to represent Australia's uh, Indigenous water interests uh, internationally. Um, so I expect in in future uh, conferences and uh, and particularly in the UN, you you will see that that person. Uh, Mr. Justin Mohammed uh, becoming more prominent there uh, in representing that. Um, so I might leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And yesterday, this morning, uh, my brothers and sisters from Indigenous communities and peoples were very um, concerned because we did not hear much yesterday, but Australia saved the the day because you mentioned the commitment to include indigenous peoples in your presentation yesterday and we really wanted to acknowledge that i will now invite the parliamentary secretary honorable terry dugit from canada to take the floor well thank you uh, to our moderator to our excellent uh, panelists uh, this afternoon and uh, and all of the participants heard me oh, sorry <laughs> i thought i was already getting uh, corrected by our moderator but uh, uh, but uh, it's wonderful to be here with uh, with all of you and uh, i want to give a particular shout out to our indigenous uh, leaders who have spoken uh, in very inspiring uh, uh, terms and uh, they are really showing us the way on on uh, both nature and, and water conservation. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the Lenape people. We pay respect to the Lenape people's past, present, and future. And I'm, I'm so uh, pleased to be here with, uh, with all of you at the UN 2023 Water Conference, a once uh, in a generation opportunity to put water at the forefront of sustainable development and our global response uh, to climate change. I hear some 1,500 uh, side events, uh, thousands of people, uh, a very uh, robust uh, uh, and Indigenous uh, uh, presence here that uh, we need to hear from. And so I'm uh, really, really excited uh, to be here. And I'm also proud to share Canada's commitments related to water governance, biodiversity, sustainable development, climate change adaptation, and working with Indigenous uh, peoples. And let me begin on water governance. Uh, we are so, so blessed in, in Canada. We have, uh, we are home to 20% of the world's uh, fresh water. Uh, but increasingly that water is being challenged by pollution, by climate change. Some of the issues that uh, have been raised today are happening in, in my country, in our country. And um, that is why our government has made significant commitments to advance uh, freshwater protection and restoration, including implementing a strengthened freshwater action plan and in, in many of our lakes and rivers, and advancing modernization of the Canada Water Act to reflect uh, Canada's freshwater reality, including climate change and Indigenous rights, which we've heard a lot about uh, today. We recognize the importance of cross-cultural cooperation on water and in its commitment to establish a new Canada Water Agency, our government has indicated that a new agency will work collaboratively with provinces, territories, indigenous peoples, local authorities, uh, scientists, and others to find the best way to keep our water safe, clean, and well-managed. As we know, uh, as many of you have pointed out, uh, water and biodiversity are closely connected. As host to the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity and, uh, and to COP15, uh, Canada welcomed the world to Montreal not all that long ago in late uh, 2022. And working closely with uh, other parties, uh, we achieved agreement on an ambitious framework 
uh, to halt and reverse biodiversity loss by 2030 by conserving 30% of land, inland water, and coastal and marine areas, and ensuring that at least 30% uh, of the world's degraded ecosystems uh, are under restoration. Canada was pleased to see representation from around the world at COP15, including governments, Indigenous peoples, women, subnational governments, environmental groups, youth, business, industry, and civil uh, society. The final framework is indeed a framework for all. Canada is committed to implementing the framework. Uh, already, we have started to develop a comprehensive, updated national biodiversity strategy and action plan to 2030 in collaboration with partners and stakeholders. For Canada, strengthening the role of Indigenous peoples and women as conservation partners is a key focus and priority. That is why we're supporting a feasibility assessment for an Indigenous protected area in the Seal River watershed. As explained earlier by the Alliance, by Stephanie, this is one of the world's largest remaining ecologically intact watershed. It's in our home province. And I look forward to uh, coming and paddling with you uh, down the uh, down the Seal River. And uh, we need to protect this, this very, very important uh, space. And again, it is Indigenous peoples that are leading the way in conservation. And there is no way uh, that we can make our 30% uh, by 30 uh, 2030 targets without uh, the full participation and leadership of our Indigenous communities. At the international level, the Canadian government is committed to mobilizing financial resources to close the biodiversity finance gap, including our COP15 pledge of 350 million to support developing countries. Canada has remained steadfast in its commitment to advancing sustainable development and the sustainable development goals domestically and internationally. To be more inclusive and to ensure that no one is left behind, Canada believes that women and marginalized groups should be at the forefront of global sustainability activities, including those uh, initiated as part of the International Decade for Action on Water for Sustainable Development. This belief is further reflected in Canada's feminist foreign policy. Another priority for the Government of Canada related to sustainable development goals is climate change adaptation, which is, has, as you know, an important intersection with water. It is unequivocal that Canada's climate has changed and will continue to change. Uh, preparing and adapting will make Canadians and our communities safer and healthier, shield our economy from shocks, and help avoid some of the steep costs associated with extreme weather. To this end, in November 2022, the Government of Canada released Canada's first national adaptation strategy. The strategy is a whole of society blueprint to reduce the risks of climate related disasters, improve health outcomes, protect nature and biodiversity, uh, build and maintain resilient infrastructure, and support a strong economy and workers. But Canada's adaptation efforts are not only domestic. As a party to the Paris Agreement, Canada is also committed to providing financing to support developing countries in implementing climate adaptation measures. And in fact, uh, at uh, the most recent COPs, we committed 5.3 billion dollars with a B to climate finance. Uh, in all the initiatives I've described today, Indigenous peoples are key partners. The Government of Canada is committed to working with Indigenous peoples and advancing reconciliation. And as a part of this commitment, the Prime Minister of Canada has directed every every federal minister to implement uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, and to work in partnership with Indigenous peoples to advance their rights. In June 2021, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act uh, became law in our country, and this legislation advances the implementation of UNDRIP as a key step in reviewing uh, the Government of Canada's relationship with Indigenous peoples. And just uh, in closing, uh, freshwater, uh, climate change, and biodiversity are inextricably linked. Our shared commitments to common goals in these areas will help ensure a healthier, more equitable, and sustainable future for everyone. Uh, Indigenous peoples, member states, and the UM system will be central to achieving these goals. 
Uh, thank you again to the excellent presenters and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This morning we had a side event where we highlighted alliance and coalition and co-responsibility in all levels. So I would like to invite Jorge Arturo, the Presidente Municipal de Barrios Doel de Chiapas. Barrios Doel. Barrios. Dos minutos, si lo puede claro, mantener, sí. por favor. Muy buenas tardes, excelentísima Marta Delgado. Muchas gracias por estar acá. Eh, a nombre de todos mis compañeros presidentes municipales de Chiapas, quiero eh, hacer este comentario. Creo que muchas veces eh, nosotros como presidentes municipales jugamos un papel importantísimo para poder tener lo que todos decíamos de ese contacto con comunidades y muchas veces todo lo que se habla queda en letras y solamente en papeles. Nosotros en Berriozábal, Chiapas, creamos un organismo municipal de servicios comunitarios de agua y saneamiento. A través de este organismo nosotros estamos creando las gestoras comunitarias del agua para cuidar todo el, el tema ambiental, para que las comunidades tengan voz y voto. Hoy en Chiapas, las mujeres tienen realmente esa voz para poder llevar a cabo los comités comunitarios del agua, que a través del trabajo en conjunto con fundaciones y asociaciones civiles, hemos logrado de invertir más de 20 millones de pesos extras de nuestro presupuesto para lo que es rehabilitación de sistemas de agua potable, eh, baños secos, lo que es también eh, proyectos de cosechas de agua, que en algunas comunidades no tienen una fuente de río o de agua cerca y que a través de estos proyectos vamos mejorando la calidad de vida de todas las comunidades, pero que también es muy importante el saber que nosotros atacamos otro problema también que es de salud, porque si mejoramos la calidad de vida y de agua de las comunidades, mejoramos la salud. Les enseñamos también a clorar su agua a cuidar lo que es el afluente de todo lo que es el sistema ambientalista de las comunidades. Y créanme que hoy tenemos más de 40 gestoras del agua creadas en comités lideradas por mujeres y que eso está transformando totalmente la vida de muchas mujeres y hombres, niños y niñas de las comunidades de Versado en Chiapas. Chiapas es un bello, hermoso estado de México y que está a las puertas abiertas para cuando nos quieran visitar les mostramos todo lo que estamos haciendo en este tema tan importante para nosotros. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Agradecemos al presidente municipal por ese ejemplo concreto. Iniciamos esta actividad hablando sobre la necesidad de transformar la gobernanza del agua. Y aquí estamos viendo un ejemplo. Entonces, muchas gracias. I would like to invite eh, Prem Taru Singh from the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact to share with us. Um, Myrna, maybe what would make sense, we're just closing, maybe the other network as well. Max, maybe you want to come up. Uh, and if uh, Max off, uh, and also is Pavel is here as well from Aborigan Fund. Pavel, do you want to come and join us? Just to say that- One minute. One each. minute, it's one minute. But there were all these indigenous people from around the world who traveled to Dushanbe, Tajikistan last year to speak on behalf of indigenous peoples. And this is to recognize all the networks. So FILAC uh, from uh, IPAC, uh, Asia, uh, the Aborigine Forum from Siberia and the Russian Uh, territories and um, from the Caribbean network. So just a very brief word from each of you. And we believe there's a song to close. Oh my God. Okay, so <laughs> one minute each. <laughs> okay, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, excellencies, distinguished delegates and our relatives. Thank you very much to get this opportunity to share the experiences from Asia. Uh, we Indian peoples have very inherent and reciprocal types of relationship with the water resources. And based on the water resources, we have our one culture, one rituals, one our identity means our caste systems, means caste system means naming of our surname. Caste system means not that uh, touchability, untouchability or superior or uh, minor. So means our identity is completely based on uh, the our uh, knowledge our education, uh, which is from the source of water. 
So here means our indigenous knowledge systems and the systems which are running to the management and governance of water are not just, you know, means uh, providing us the water, but at the meantime, uh, it's also it's also contributing to mitigate and means adapt the environmental challenges, the uh, uh, means and climate crises mm -hmm. and uh, loss of uh, biodiversity. So our our indigenous knowledge, our practices, and our customer institutions are most important, which are completely based on the nature-based solution, and it's 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 on the collective-based approach. So as we are now here talking about the water action uh, water action decade and water action agenda, collective approach of indigenous peoples are very important. So it's not only the states, it's not only uh, the indigenous communities, it's not only uh, the UN agencies, we also to work together and there is need of a strong collaboration and partnership to make this water action agenda uh, true, means uh, to make it, uh, 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 to achieve the common uh, targeted goals. So thank you very much for again, uh, this opportunity. <laughs> thank you very uh, yeah, much. Thank you again. That's Max, would you like to share? Okay, thank you very much also to the organizers for having me here. As I have only one minute, um, I'll go straight to my recommendations. And um, of course, a lot of things have already been said on, on water, so I don't need to repeat them. I want to emphasize water is not a thing. It's it's life. It's um, It's spiritual. It has a spirit itself. You need to respect water. If we don't respect water, if we don't respect nature, nature will not respect us. And that's exactly what's happening in the world today. And we see the impacts of that. So um, I, I would like to ask for commitments for the future. And uh, those are harder commitments on effectively respecting human rights and rights holders. We hear UNDRIP recognizes us as rights holders. We, we hear the word rights holders so many times, but still we are not respected in our countries, not enough. Some countries have um, more progressive laws, but in general, not. We're not at the table. Myrna mentioned it. All of us mentioned it. We're not sufficiently at the table. So that, that is one first recommendation to have harder commitments and effectively put uh, words into practice. Um, respect especially our collective rights. As we've heard also, um, our lands are often the place where the water comes from, where the water is still fresh, where the water will be in the future because the rest of the world will be spoiled. So please help us to protect the remaining waters on earth. Help us to get more power, capacity strengthening to protect our territories and waters in our own ways, not in the um, modern destructive ways, they call it protected areas, but they allow mining. Have direct participation with us, indigenous peoples. Um, we have so many examples where there are millions of, of dollars or euros or whatever given to intermediate organizations that do their own thing, unfortunately. We've seen that in so many countries that, um, in name of climate change, in name of development, et cetera, uh, big institutions, and I will not call names, are spending a lot of money on indigenous peoples, but we don't see it in our communities. So have these direct uh, linkages with us. And um, finally, to have stronger structures and mechanisms for our effective participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, good day, brothers and sisters. I just, I'm going to be quick. I want to thank you for your fight, for a fight for the Mother uh, Earth, for uh, water, for uh, the future, for the future generation. Thank you. And I would like to sing a song for you about water. Mm. <laughs> In река через соломы снега 
И мы плывем по той реке, где капитан Иудег, Сулян Зигла и Геанка, Калун Зигла и Суанка, Ее священный берега течет века, Викин река. Всю бревет, таймень плывет, И тигр свою добычу ждет, Хранят сокровища реки, Надежно жители тайги, Сулян Зига и Геанка, Калун Зига и Суанка. Священны эти берега, Течет века веки. Beautiful ending, very good ending of this great conversation that started two years ago, but that recuperate, I would say, all of the history of resistance of indigenous peoples from we were colonized. And we come today to say we need to decolonize the way in which water has been managed because water is not only water. We talk about nexus, nexus for us, water, life, land, territory, rights, that's the nexus. And we come with good faith to build alliance, to build coalition, we understand the core responsibility of indigenous peoples, of government, of UN agencies, of all stakeholders. And we can only act now, as it has been said, to change the situation if we work together. But we can only work if we recognize the rights of all the ones that are around the table and in this session. So thank each one of you for attending the session and you have the commitment from us to continue working together. So thank you. Yeah. Gracias.